Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Load shedding continues to exact a toll on the economy and the mood of South Africans. Terence Kramer joins me to discuss the prospects for new interventions. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. It's been an intense start to 2023 from a load shedding perspective. Why? Well yes, it's the most intensive start I think we've ever had. Every single day this year we've had load shedding and at times at stage six, which is very, very intense. And there were very serious fears that we were going to dip uh, even uh, below that level to sort of 8,000 megawatts, so stage eight, as mining industry returned uh, and the, schools, uh, the school holidays came to an end or the summer holidays came to an end. So far, we haven't moved in that direction, but the, the system remains very precarious. And the reasons are the same as ever, and it's really the continual decline in the performance of the Eskom coal fleet and amplified uh, at the moment by three units at Kusile having been forced off line because of the sort of pollution control system there having failed catastrophically last year. So that's a, it's a large amount of uh, uh, energy that would have been baked into the summer plan which is just not available and then obviously amplified by the one unit of Kuburg also being off but generally it's the breakdowns uh, at the, the old coal-fired power stations which have been under maintained for so long. And then adding to the pressure at the currently is that there's just no money left for Eskom to spend on diesel, which has the potential to reduce load shedding by two stages about if we're running at uh, full throttle, but you need a lot of money to do that. And we were told in November that Eskom had more than exhausted uh, its diesel budget, I think it had already spent more than double the six billion that was baked in for the year. So there's no relief coming from that side. And then we know on the, the other supply side, the non eskom supply, there have been a lot of delays in bringing that on. So that's why we're in a very, very intense period again uh, this year. What are some of these short-term interventions being discussed? There's a lot of focus at the moment on diesel because it's, it is one way that you can reduce the intensity of load shedding. It's already installed. Uh, we don't have to build anything. We just have to buy the diesel. There are logistics constraints around the plants, particularly Ankerlich, which is supplied by truck. So we can only burn at a certain level. I think Eskom estimates at around 2.4 billion rand a month type purchase of diesel. That's sort of the technical limit because of the logistics constraints. But then we can't get to that point at the moment because Eskom exhausted its budget. They have they got some initial relief from Petro SA and they've announced last week that they bought a, another tranche of diesel and you can see on the daily reports that get put out that they are using both their open cycle gas turbines and the open cycle gas turbines of the private sector, RPPs, during the peak periods. But I think what uh, the view is that we may need to be using diesel even more intensively outside of peak just to lower this uh, whole, the levels of load shedding, which, you know, at stage four, five, and then sometimes six, and the threat of eight, it's just not manageable for, for society and for businesses. So I think that there's a big focus on that, but there's huge resistance from the National Treasury, as you can understand why, because there's so many competing demands. Um, the energy regulator, obviously, we know for this year it's exhausted, and for next year it's going to be exhausted pretty quickly as well, the diesel budget, <laughs> because they've uh, approved eight billion, which is more than the six billion that was approved for this last year, but nowhere near the sort of levels that if you're running it at a 12% capacity factor, which is what Eskom said it needs to reduce the, the levels of load shedding. So there's quite a lot of focus on diesel, and then obviously uh, they're seen as a low-hanging fruit of getting. Um, rooftop solar going and a lot of focus there on tax incentives, net billing, feed-in tariffs, all those sort of things. I think there's a, there's a lot of attention, there's a lot of technical thought going into this. Uh, we know that Eskom at the moment has a standard offer for commercial customers and they don't have for residential customers at all. Uh, that standard offer uh, has also been expanded and has been approved in the NERSA uh, approval for next year so they, they can get some more megawatts through that. But this would be a much bigger systemic change. Would, could, could we get uh, residents and businesses that have rooftop solar to support the grid? And should they be incentivized to do that? 
I think there's a lot of tension uh, and there's a lot of opportunity, but South African processes tend to take very long on this. It is a quick fix, but it's not as quick as, say, buying more diesel, for instance. So there's that big focus. And then, you know, the other would be demand response you know, and, and also demand side management and getting people to re reduce their, their consumption. So those are really the only short term levers other than getting the, the coal fleet into a more stable uh, position to produce the energy that we need every day. And that requires maintenance, which requires time and space, neither of which ESKIM has at the moment because they're load shedding. So it's going to be a hard or tall order. I mean, I know there's a, there's a, there's a huge focus on the six big opportunity, six power stations where there's the most opportunity to get more energy into the system. And I'm sure some of that will definitely yield some uh, good results at some point, but it's a tall order to just change your trajectory from, you know, secular decline that we've been in and just expect a hockey stick type turn, which is what I think um, the energy minister has been suggesting is possible. But, it, you know, I think there is a lot of attention going and there must be a stabilization of that, but it can't be the only lever. Uh, so we're going to have to look at other short term, short term levers as well. What are some of the possible medium to longer term solutions? Well, the longer term solution is definitely to build as if, uh, as one analyst says, uh, our lives and livelihoods depend on it. We'll build the, the uh, least regret and uh, there's no really headroom at the moment because we need so much. We've got such a backlog. The least regret is as much solar wind and, and, and complementary generators, so flexible generators, whether that's battery storage, whether that's gas. Uh, whether that's using the diesel fleet differently, et cetera, that would be the long term. And to, to enable that, you need massive grid investment and also possibly a different way of managing the grid, the transmission and distribution grid. You know, the, one of the opportunities, it seems, around rooftop solar is that the grid exists. You know, we, we all our houses are grid connected and there's no need to build additional assets. There, there might be a management challenge, but the, the assets are in place. Management of those assets is, is going to be challenging with variable renewable energy, but that is an opportunity. And th then I think uh, in the more medium, it seems like they want to look at an emergency procurement of something. Whether that's going to be diesel, we know that Eskom tried to bring in 3,000 megawatts of gas to power at Richards Bay and through lots of uh, you know um, procedural issues, wasn't able to get that approved by the NERSA to, to deviate from the RP. But I think we're going to see some sort of procurement, emergency procurement in the next couple of months. But again, our processes take a while, even if it's emergency. And therefore, I think the power ship option is going to be looked at again. The issue for people is not so much, I think, the power ship as an immediate re reliever of the system. The issue was the structure of that procurement. 20 years, uh, very high tariffs. Um, you know, no sharing of the gas to the rest of the, the gas infrastructure that could come in. Uh, and, and at the moment, that's actually consuming grid precious grid infrastructure, the fact that these things are in abeyance. So, but I think there's going to be some sort of emergency. But, uh, but I think what we need to do is do, you know, do some of the emergency stuff, but do as much that is future-oriented as possible. So you can't go wrong by building more soda and wind can't go wrong by building more grid and you can't go wrong generally by building the right st more storage um, it, de uh, it depends you know so obviously there's always there can be a cost to all these things and then you can't really go wrong by getting a, s a stabilization of the Eskom fleet but you can make big mistakes in a crisis and we have to be sh you know we can't do knee jerk very expensive things unfortunately the immediate lever being diesel is very expensive and, uh, and it's going to be a, a balancing act to see can we do that it's a cost benefit analysis it's clear that load shedding costs more than diesel but still it's a massive decision to make because you're going to be spending a lot of billions of rands on something that you should never have had to spend on because you should have already been building the replacement fleet uh, um, for for the coal fleets at the pace and scale that was needed but we had that seven-year disruption that was really a state-captured type decision and, and we're in backlog. Well, moving ESCOM to the DMRE help. 
No, it won't help at all. One, it's a distraction again from a governance perspective and you're having to, um, uh, you know, be different reporting lines. The other thing is it's really bad for policy. <laughs> at the moment, the f energy future, so what's good for the electricity supply industry, what I was talking about, the least regret options, and what's good for Eskom are diverging often. And what's going to happen now policy-wise, if you've got the uh, shareholder department no longer being the DP, be being the, the energy minister, the Eskom tail is going to wag the energy supply industry dog because you're going to be making decisions in the interests of I what you think is good for Eskom. Um, and that's going to have a lot of negative consequences. For one, I think it's going to seriously delay the unbundling, which for the future of the energy system, the transitioning system, is vital. We need this. You can see the problem of not having this uh, grid and system operator outside of Eskom, uh, particularly when it comes to grid access. I mean, Madupi and Kusile never had the grid access issues that the, the wind farms are having at the moment. And there was no grid, in, well, especially up in Limpopo when Madupi was built. It didn't stop them from building it, whereas we're stopping wind farms, farms from going ahead. So it's very, very problematic from a policy perspective, from a governance perspective, it is, a, is also very problematic. We see that there's already political interference that's penetrated even through having a separate shareholder department. Now we're going to have almost a hands-on type thing. And we saw at the Zonda Commission well, the outcome of that. It's just deleterious, it's problematic, it's bad for governance. We should actually be trying to lower the political links. And the governance structure should really be in a, not even in a department, it should be in a a corporate ties holding company, as they do in Singapore and elsewhere, and have really very little opportunity for political interference into boards and into especially the day-to-day -day running. So, no, it will not be good from a short-term perspective because of the distraction. It's an unnecessary distraction, but it's really bad for the long term. When do you think some of the solutions will be communicated? Well, that's the big question. You know, we know that the president's locked NECOM or the crisis committee into a room this week, and they've been consulting with lots of people this week. Uh, but we've heard nothing publicly. Eskom was supposed to have a briefing to give us some sort of system outlook when there were the fears, I think, that we were going to slip into stage eight. That was cancelled in the interests of these consultations. Uh, we know that the president's very process-driven, very consultation-driven. So I think he'll want all that in place before an announcement will be made. Whether NECOM will make it, whether the ESCOM will make it, I doubt it's probably going to come from the president, but we've got absolutely no visibility. And anger's growing, you know, and there's a feeling that, you know, this is a crisis and we need someone to talk to us and give us some direction as to what is the plan. And the fact that Plan A, which was announced in July, seems mostly either not to be being implemented or is failing, to, uh, you know, is there a plan B in certain circumstances? So we need to have some communications. At the moment, it's, it's a blackout, a uh, bit, bit like what we're having. It's sort of we're being load shed on the, on the communication front as well, which I don't think South Africans can tolerate for, for very much longer. So I suspect there will be a briefing fairly soon. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.